Greetings and welcome uh, back to room 303. This is a uh, continuation of our Harvard Classic Lectures, and we'll be working now with uh, Plato's Phaedo. Now, just to remind, this is the fourth dialogue in what is often referred to as the final days of Socrates. And I've already given a lecture uh, on uh, Euthyphro and Apology together and uh, Crato, and now we are uh, uh, turning to the fourth of those dialogues, the Phaedo. Now, uh, right away, let's go ahead and just make some quick observations um, for your notes. Uh, my assumption is that you've already watched some previous lectures and possibly even you've watched my lectures on Plato's Republic. I'm going to review some of those kinds of ideas to talk about the Phaedo because you have to talk about Platonic theory of the forms and we'll be talking about that and I know that that's an idea that I've already shared with you before. But before we get there I just want to begin with a schemata that maybe will help us kind of tie our study of Republic into our study of Phaedo one of the most influential dialogues of Plato because of the argument for the existence of the immortality of the soul. Uh, let's think of it this way. When we studied our Republic IV, we were introduced to four cardinal virtues. You'll remember those. They sat in kind of that pyramid, remember, as we were talking about different classifications of the ideal Republic, and you'll remember that at the very top, correlative to the leaders, was the virtue of wisdom, right? Uh, right below that, correlative to the soldiers, the, uh, the keepers of security, uh, the virtue of courage. Right below that, the workers and those who are working in our ideal state are going to evince the virtue of uh, out of the Greek, it's sometimes hard to translate. In the older translation, it was temperance. Today, we might call it discipline, that willingness to do the thing that you have to do, even though maybe you, you don't want to do it. Sometimes, maybe always thought of as duty. And then finally, the fourth virtue is to put them all together, justice. Those are our four cardinal virtues. Now, watch how we can look at the four dialogues that are sometimes called the final days of Socrates, and we can think a little bit about how each one of these cardinal virtues is emphasized, although all of them are emphasized in every one of those dialogues, those four, each one is emphasized in a very particular way. Think about this. Socrates is standing outside the courtyard, yes? The courtyard outside the, the uh, courtroom, and he's having a conversation in Euthyphro with a young man who is about to go in and condemn his father for something that his father did. And Socrates' question is, of course, well, is that a pious act? And how do we know what good actions or pious actions are all about? Are good actions good actions because the gods will it so? Or do the gods will it so because they are good actions? And if you'll think about it, of course, Euthyphro is going to concentrate on the virtue, the cardinal virtue of justice. Makes sense. Apology, of course, the second in the dialogue. Socrates is there in front of all of those Athenians who are going to determine his fate. We already kind of feel that this is trumped up and ultimately he's going to get jacked. But notice that this is really a dialogue that culminates with that famous line, the unexamined life is not worth living. Isn't it true that apology is a dialogue devoted to wisdom? Of course, in Crito, the dialogue that we just finished discussing uh, before, uh, Socrates is invited by Crito to escape the prison. Come on, come on, come on. We can get out of here. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And it's the old man Socrates, the teacher, the philosopher, <laughs> who's willing, wanting to sit down and say, now wait a minute. Let's not act too hasty. Let's think about this. Isn't that, of course, our virtue of temperance or discipline? It isn't that Socrates wants to die, or maybe he does, we talked about the potential death wish, but rather it's more Socrates wants to make sure that whatever life it is that he's living, he's doing it well. And that means considerations of discipline, self-discipline, temperance, moderation. There's, a, there's another way to think about that cardinal virtue. Now, we turn to Phaedo. Of the four dialogues, it could be argued that Apology and Phaedo certainly are probably the ones that are best known. But they're symphonic, as I've said before, and they all kind of go together. But there is no doubt that as Socrates is ready to drink the hemlock, the poison, 
and he's sitting talking with his pals, especially two of them, that he'll be dialoguing with. And as the conversation gets closer and closer to his drinking of that poison, it sits in a cup. The entire dialogue is constructed knowing that the poison is about to happen, knowing that Socrates is about to die. The final moments, right before he dies. And what is the cardinal virtue? Well, clearly courage. So notice how Plato is going to introduce maybe for us those cardinal virtues in our study of Republic. But it will be in these four dialogues that we will watch each one of those cardinal virtues played out. Of course, if you'll think about it, this idea of death and preparing for death, we'll come back to it later in our discussion, but we've said it before in 303 many times. Uh, you know, the only difference between you and a fly is that you know about fly swatters. We have said before that is no throwaway line, and that is a line that is derived from Plato's Phaedo. Of course, a few other texts as well that we'll mention. Part of this discussion, though, is we've known about death all our lives, but maybe never really fully appreciated it. You haven't met any 200-year-old people. Think about that. Again, that's no throwaway line. From the time you were young, they were already teaching you the concept. You're swinging at the park. You're having a great time. It's time to go. We've got to go to the van. I don't want to go to the van. No, no, no. You have to go to the van. I don't want to go to the van. I want to stay at the park. I want to play. I want to have fun. No, no, no. Understand the rules of the park and visits to the park. You only get to go to the park for a brief period of time. Then you got to get in the van and you got to go bye-bye. They were already teaching you the fundamental concept. You don't get to do this thing called live in this world forever. You have to leave. That's called death. That departure has been central to the study of so many of the texts that we will talk about in a philosophy class, a literature class, a humanities class. And here we are now dealing with one of the classics of all classics. The great French writer Pascal, in trying to describe what death was like in a very morbid kind of picture, says we're like humans that are all chained up. And every day a few of those humans are let out in front of the rest of us and they're bludgeoned to death, terrible, mutilated death. And we all get to watch in horror. And then we all realize our number is soon to be called. It's a dark, pessimistic kind of view of what it means to live in this world. But this is what literature often will do for us. It kind of yanks us away. It kind of reaches out to us and says, hey, have you thought about this? Because you know it's coming. In other words, to quote an idea of Plato, we have a tendency to forget the things we know. And certainly Phaedo is going to bring this directly to our, to our study, to our vision. We have other kind of classics. We think, of course, of that three-day howl at the conclusion of Tolstoy's The Death of Ivan Ilyich. He's a big shot, he falls, he hurts himself against the window. Of course, he you know, gets cancer. It's this slow process of coming to terms with the fact that he's got to die. We will mar marry that kind of an end. Tolstoy's Ilyich screaming for three final days of intense horror pain about not just the physical part of his dying, but of course that emotional, spiritual, mental part of having to leave. And we'll marry that and measure that against, for example, the way that Socrates will come to the final moments of his death in Phaedo. Again, all of the classics reminding us that death is coming. And we will see this in the study of Phaedo, this notion that the philosopher is the one who trains, prepares for death in some way. We think, of course, about the idea that the great classics were the ways to show us, readers, students, viewers, thinkers, how to prepare for death and how to experience death as best we can. Think about those final words as we love to teach about it of Beowulf in the great Anglo-Saxon poem. Beowulf is about to die, he's been bitten by the dragon, and he makes those final comments requesting, of course, that barrow, that lighthouse at the very conclusion of his life. Why? Because he wants to leave his life as kind of like a, uh, a model for the Anglo-Saxon soldiers to, to come. Let's turn now to uh, the Harvard Classics, Volume 2. And let's turn now to the Dialogue Phaedo. And again, you don't have to have a copy of Harvard Classics, Volume 2 to be able to follow along. You can go online. You can find a copy easily of this translation of Phaedo. 
And let's go ahead and make some general introductory comments and then let's work level one, shall we? We're just going to basically talk about what is this dialogue about. Let's give a big picture view really, really quick just for your notes. Phaedo is about the last words that Socrates will speak before he drinks the hemlock and dies. Poison. Again, 399 BCE. And the conversation will turn to predominantly two issues. One, the issue of death, and exactly what is it. And Socrates will say, well, it's nothing more than the separation of the departure of the body from the soul, what we will call later, here in a moment, dualism. Uh, I'm sorry, the soul? Body, I get. You can see it, you can taste it, we won't get into it. We'll talk about it in a moment. But soul, like, what are you even talking about? No, no, there's this thing called your soul. And it's immortal. It doesn't die. It doesn't, it doesn't cease to exist with the cessation of your body. Well, what are you talking about? And for the rest of the dialogue, we will have that kind of discussion. However, I want you to put it in your notes right now. That when you really study this dialogue close, you realize that what Socrates is actually doing is not so much making a definitive argument for the existence of soul, the separation of the soul from the body, but rather that the well-lived life will mean that you don't fear the moment of your death because you're always preparing. And the way you prepare is to feed or nurture your soul. And so we'll, we'll come back to it. Phaedo, by the way, is the narrator, and what he's doing is he's telling a friend of his who has asked him, you were there in the cell, were you not, with Socrates when he was about to die? Oh, yes, oh, yes, I was. Can you tell me about it? So notice, and we'll talk later about this at 2B in our rhetorical analysis of this dialogue, but notice that you've got a dialogue where you have a story within a story, if you get my drift. And every once in a while, there will be kind of like this pause where Phaedo's pal will say, well, what happened next? And what was the energy in the cell like? And that kind of thing. Okay. And then we'll have the story told, okay, where we'll hear... Socrates, and he'll have this dialogue back and forth, especially because he's surrounded by several of his pals. By the way, Plato, we're told, is ill and therefore not able to be there. Okay, But Simeus and Cebus are going to be the two that will exchange the majority of the conversation. There will be some comments by Crito uh, at the end of the dialogue. Crito is going to ask Socrates about how do you want to be buried, what's the big deal here about you know, your body, etc., etc., and Socrates just kind of laughs at him and says, hey, if you can catch me, you can bury me. Uh, again, we're going to come back to this notion of the irony of Socrates and, of course, the idea that the soul transcends the body. At the very beginning of the dialogue, and now we'll just kind of turn to the dialogue itself and some conversations about um, the opening lines of the dialogue, Phaedo telling his, his pal about, you know, the experience of what this was all like just to begin, he says... I remember, he says, the strange feeling which came over me at being with him, Socrates. For I could hardly believe that I was present at the death of a friend, and therefore I did not pity him. His mean and his language, his actions, were so noble and fearless in the hour of death that to me he appeared blessed. I thought that in going to the other world he could not be without a divine call, and that he would be happy if ever man was when he arrived there. and Therefore, I did not pity him as might seem natural at such a time. But neither could I feel the pleasure which I usually felt in philosophical discourse, for philosophy was the theme of which we spoke. I was pleased and I was also pained, because I knew that he was soon to die, and this strange mixture of feeling was shared by us all, and we were laughing and weeping by turns sense. And we'll ask even at the end of our conversation here at 3B, if you've ever had the experience of being someone with someone right before they pass away, uh, it is an honor, of course, we will say, to be with an individual and to, to share that time. Phaedo says, it was a very difficult experience. We wanted to talk philosophy, but there's the cup. There's the cup of hemlock always waiting, always waiting. We'll have some staging information. The wife, the children will come in. Again, it's kind of bizarre to talk about it, but Socrates is an old man with young children. But he very quickly wants to send them away. We mentioned this in Crito that it's possible that Socrates 
is could be interpreted as somewhat of a hard-hearted individual for not caring more about his wife and children, but he wants to send them away. He doesn't want the distraction, and even at the very end again, there will be some return of this, and he, he doesn't want to have to mess with it. He will, we are told, be preparing for his death by writing poems. A lot has been made about this, that uh, Socrates, the great speaker, is finally going to be messing around rivaling Aesop, he says, no, uh, uh, writing some poems. In other words, he turns to music, he turns to art at the final moments of his life when he's beginning to leave, uh, preparing to die. This, the question of suicide comes up, and, and why, not just take your, uh, why not just take your life? And uh, the response is an interesting one for Socrates. He says something like, um, you know, look, the gods are in charge of our lives, Ironically, because Socrates has been accused of atheism, he's speaking about the gods. And it's their decision as to when I die, not mine. He said it would be like my owning an ox who decides that he needs to go off and die. I would be upset about that. In other words, I get to determine when the ox dies, he says, not the ox. This is his answer to suicide. So you can see already, Plato is going to cover some major territory here as we go to work. He will, in fact, talk about death and leaving as flying away. To fly away, he says. And then he says, um, I am quite ready to acknowledge that I ought to be grieved at death if I were not persuaded that I am going to other gods who are wise and good. In other words, right away, Socrates will say, I'm not worried about death. But it does make sense for us to ask the philosophic question, what is death? Now let's go ahead and pause there in our notes, and let's pay attention now to this idea of what is death. And the answer, of course, is, well, death is the separation of the body from the soul. Now it's at this point that we will already begin to be introduced to this notion of the theory of the forms. Now, I know because you followed along already with us in the lectures on Plato's Republic, book six and seven, that you already know about the theory of the forms, but I want to go back over it again and I want to review it because if you don't understand this concept, the reading of Phaedo for you is going to be very, very difficult. There are a lot of ways to talk about the theory of the forms. The way that we often do it in 303 is to discuss the theory of the forms by putting two boxes side by side. So it would make sense for you to again do this. Above the first box we'll put images, above the second box we'll put uh, forms or the word concepts or the word ideas. These are different and interchangeable words. We of course pointed out that we imagine Socrates sitting at the center of the mall there, as we have said, at the fountain. And he's working with several of his young students, uh, and he invites them into the, uh, into the bookstore, maybe we would say. And he says, hey, fellas, I want you to take a look at a drop-dead gorgeous body, a beautiful Sports Illustrated swimsuit model, or a Victoria's Secret model. And, of course, in the first box here, we will place, then, the beautiful, right, body. Beautiful, gorgeous. But he asks about that beautiful body. Think for just a moment about the passage of time. And there will come a moment in time when people will no longer think that this woman has this drop-dead, gorgeous body. As we say in 303, everything sags and bags if you stay alive long enough. And yet... There is this concept that we will call, right, beauty, which will survive the physical body of this Sports Illustrated Swimsuit model. We, of course, played this game in our earlier lectures several times. You will maybe remember the young student of mine who came in and he wanted to discuss with, uh, with me uh, God. He was our best math student and he walked in and he said, Mr. McGee, I don't, I don't believe in God. And I said, oh, 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 okay. And he said, well, don't you want to ask me why? And he went like this on the table. And I said, God is a table? And he said, no, 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 no. Watch. I can do that with this table. Uh, can you do that for me with God? To which I said, well, 
let me ask you this. And I went to the whiteboard and I played the game of Plato. And more particularly, quite literally, the game of uh, the Phaedo, where I asked him this question, well, what is that? And he said, come on, you know what that is. That's a number two. And I said, yeah, but is it? Because look, I could do that right there and make that squiggle mark and that could be two. And the truth of the matter is, if we really wanted to jack with a bunch of uh, fifth graders, we could say that number three is actually two. Why? Because these are nothing more than symbols which represent a concept we will call number. And then I went, I went to the same table and I went, where's, where's two? Can you imagine a bunch of fifth graders saying to their math teacher, I'm, we're not doing math anymore until you show us where the actual number two is. Of course, I make this observation with seniors because they understand it, don't they? A huge difference between sex or the exchange of fluids and this thing that we call love, right? Uh, I tell the story many, many years ago of a group of, uh, of addicts that I was working with, heroin addicts, and I said to them, hey, fellas, as we were talking, I was at the park, my daughter, young daughter was there playing back behind them, beautiful day, a little two-year-old daughter playing, and I said to them, fellas, uh, you know, I, I don't think that what we want is drugs, and in the first box here we would put drugs, um, I don't think so. And of course, one of them said, hey, dude, we're heroin addicts. Are you kidding me? And I said, yeah, I know that. But I don't think, I don't think heroin is actually what we want. What we want, of course, was the question that was asked to me. And I just at the moment saw my daughter there running through the grass, her arms out like she's flying. And I asked them, you know, think about this. It isn't the high, the drugs that we want. What we want is freedom, right? And we put that in the second box. We want freedom. We, of course, think that drugs will give us that freedom, that sense of escape and freedom. And, of course, for a moment in time, that will happen, yes? But, of course, it goes away. And that, tragically, is the essence of all things.